I will thank you very much for these faithful believers, children of God. For always your money. And then for all our other brothers and sisters, members of the family of God. All over Lagos State and all over Nigeria, all over Africa and beyond Africa. Lord, we just pray that your blessings will enrich every one of us, every one of them in Jesus' name. Open our eyes to see tonight. Make us, a, make us, a Lord, in our heart to comprehend everything you are revealing to us in Jesus' name. And all those who are uniting together with us and we're making this message to go across to thousands of people. We pray as we are blessing us who are hearing. Bless them who are walking to in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. We can see that Matthew chapter 7. We come to verse 7 once again. Matthew chapter 7 verse 7. And we're reading all through to verse 11. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son shall ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts your children, how much more? Shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? We have looked at those verses before, but we, we checked up on the word ask. We have also looked at the word seek. Now tonight we are looking at the word knock. If you look at verse 7, it says, Knock and it shall be opened unto you. And then in verse 8 it says, And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. This brief passage contains a law for the education and edification of every child of God at that time, at this time, in every age. The privilege and the power of prayer is not led on the unreachable branches of a tree of philosophy but of the branches that are low enough, all members, children, youths, adults, men, women, newcomers and old timers, everybody, to be able to reach out and pluck the fruits out of this tree. In these verses, the Lord is not giving us some deep well of theological mystery with nothing to draw with. What I mean by that is, there are some people, whenever they teach or preach from the Bible, they make the well so deep, and there is nothing, no container, no bucket to be able to draw the water out. Although they may tell us about this and that in our prayer, about faith, but all their sin is so high that we cannot reach out to it. And it's so deep, we cannot get anything out of it. But you see how the Lord teaches. Everything is very simple. And illustrations He gives to make us understand how we can pray, how we can believe, how we can receive. Everything looks very simple for us to be able to get. And so the Lord has brought the supply of every need to the table. And we do well to come and dine. You'll be satisfied. You think verses uh, supply the key to the interpretation and the application of what we're reading. Where to ask, where to seek, and where to knock. These three verses or these three verbs are in the present imperative in the original language of the text. That we say is in the present imperative means number one is in the present tense. It's not that you are asking before, but you are going to ask in the future. And also, it's in the imperative. It's a command. And then the way it was constructed in original language, it means you ask and keep on asking until you receive. 
it means you seek and you keep on seeking until you find. And then it means you knock and you keep on knocking, keep on knocking, keep on knocking until the door is opened unto you. That means then pray and keep on praying. Seek and see, keep on seeking. And the Father will answer according to his promise. The whole process is put in the family setting. Look at verse 9. Or what man is there of you? Whom if a son ask bread, will he give him a stone? That verse. As you look at the whole passage, verse 7, verse 8, two verses before verse 9. Verse 10, verse 11, two verses after verse 9. That makes you to know that verse 9 is in the middle. Verse 9 is at the very center. And that very central verse tells us Jesus was talking to members of the family of God. Because it says, What man is there of you? Whom if his son shall ask bread, will he give him a stone? That central verse actually opens up the whole meaning. You see, there are people who pray and they do not know whether they are children of God or not. But the very center of this passage of prayer makes us to know is the family members, those who are children of the Heavenly Father, those are the people that come. And they come with the understanding, my Father has given me this promise, my Heavenly Father has all the resources that I need to satisfy all my wants and all my needs. Therefore, as a child in the family, I come unto God, my Heavenly Father, and it says, your Heavenly Father in verse 11 will give good things to them that ask him. As we come to that point of being sons, verse 9 again, what man is there of you? Whom if a son, his son, not another person's son, ask bread, will he give him a stool? There may be a question in your mind, son knocking at the father's door. Will you open? Of course it will open. But the question is this, uh, or are we not all the sons of God? Everybody you meet on the street, everybody you see in your community, everybody around us, are we not all the sons of God? Well, let the Bible give us the answer. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 2. Then you will find out whether everybody is a child of God, a son of God or not. In Ephesians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 3. Ephesians 2 verse 3. Among whom also we all had a conversation in times past. In the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You know, it's not everybody that's a child of God, a son of God. It's not everybody that can just jump into Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 11, and say, Hey, look at what God has promised me. No! If you look at that central verse, what man is there of you? Well, if a son has came a prayer, now the children of wrath are not the sons of God. And it says, by nature, we were all born children of wrath. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 38. There are children of wrath. And then Matthew chapter 13, verse 38, says, The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Ah, look at that. They are also children of the wicked one. And those ones cannot just jump into Matthew chapter 7 and say, Here I am I. I am asking for this, and I'm sure the Lord will answer. Those promises are given to children of God, sons of God. Number one, there are the children of us. Number two, there are the children of the wicked one. Let's look at Matthew chapter 23, verse 15. Matthew 23, verse 15, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. 
and when he is made, he make him to hold more the child of hell than yourselves. Number three now, there are children of hell. You make him to hold child of hell. And so, uh, you see what many people, they don't check up whose promises are these. And they just jump into this. They say, I claim this, I claim that. And what they claim slips, slips away from their hands. They're not able to hold what they're claiming. You know why? Because they are children of hell. And then in 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, reading from verse 10. 1 John chapter 3 verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Here we are again. There are those who are children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. You know, there are some people, let me use this language for you to understand, they are pregnant with hatred. They carry a heavy pregnancy of hatred in their belly, in their heart, in their mind. And they do not have any drop of, of the love in their heart for their neighbors, for their friends, and for the people that touched them before. And because they are pregnant with hatred, they come and they need a prayer with that pregnancy of hatred in their tummy, in their heart, and they wonder why God does not answer their prayers because the children of the devil pregnant with hatred. And they want to deliver the pregnancy of hatred anytime. And they're going to give back to children of hatred anytime. Actions of hatred in their hearts and their lives. That's why their prayers are not answered. In Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 5 and verse 6. Ephesians chapter 5. And we're reading from verse 5. It says, For this ye know that no monger no unclean person, no a covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God, of Christ, and of God. He says, if somebody is covetous, he says, if somebody is still living in sin, is an unclean person, a dirty person, an immoral person, a fornicator, an, idol an idol adulterer, adulteress, he does not have any inheritance in the kingdom. So if he knocks at the door, the door will not be open because God will say, who is there knocking? Who are you? And then he mentions his name. And then God said, let me check out the record, whether you are a part of my family or not. And then he discover he's not a part of the family, he's an adulterer, a fornicator, a sinner, a dirty, licentious, immoral person. He has no inheritance in the kingdom. So he cannot come and just say, I'm knocking. And the door will be open. In fact, it says in verse 6, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. These are children of disobedience. They're not children of God. You see, you need to analyze the Bible, understand the Bible, and then you know whose the promises are. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13, verse 10. Acts, chapter 13, verse 10, and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? You see, there are people who will try to twist and distort and pervert the right ways of the Lord. And the Bible calls them children of the devil. They are full of craftiness, deceit, deception, hypocrisy, dishonesty, insincerity. And it says, child of the devil, enemy of all righteousness. They hate holiness, they hate righteousness. And so, you know, those people cannot just come and say, Jesus said, ask, seek, knock. No. 
That promise is for those who are children of the Heavenly Father. But man, is there a few? If a son shall ask him, that is it, is a son. We're looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And then we we'll look at verse 3. In verse 3 it says, chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The son of perdition. You see those ones? All these ones who have read about, they are not children of God. Therefore they cannot come and say, I'm coming on the basis of Matthew chapter 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find, not, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. But you must remember what man is there of you, whom if his son has came bread, will he give him a stone? Now, you who are then the children of God, how do you become a child of God? We need to find out you become a child of God, a son of God, and then you'll be able to come into the promise and say, Praise the Lord, I have the assurance in my heart. I am a child of God, and I can claim the promise. How do you become a child of God, a son of God? John chapter 1 verse 12. In John chapter 1, verse 12, But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's, that's what we do. You come out of your sin, you come to Christ, and you receive Christ as your Savior. He forgives your sin. He takes all the guilt and the condemnation away. He turns your life around and he puts light, the light of the world, in your heart, in your life, as a child of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them. What does that mean? Come out from among those people we read about before. Come out from among the children of wrath. Come out from among the children of disobedience. Come out from among the children of hatred. Those who are pregnant with hatred. Come out from among them, and then be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. You turn away from sin, you come out of sin, and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior. And when that has happened, now you can come to Matthew chapter 7. Until then, you cannot come to Matthew chapter 7 and just claim everything there. Galatians chapter 4. In Galatians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 7, uh, from verse 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of, of the time was come, God sent forth a son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. For our children of wrath, our children of disobedience, our children of the wicked one, our children of the devil, but now we come to the Lord. And we receive the adoption of sons. We are adopted into the family of God. But save some because he has sons. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ 
through Christ Jesus our Lord. And now the life you live will mark you out that you are really a child of God. Welcome to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Do all things without murmuring, signs, disputes. These are the children of God. These are the sons of God. Verse 15. That she may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God. Those are the people. Blameless. Harmless, you cannot hurt anybody, child of God, son of God. You cannot harm anybody, child of God, son of God, without rebuke in, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. These are the people, and those people will come. They will come to knock, and God will open the door. I said the Lord will open the door. I divide the story to three parts. Number one, importunity in prayer, symbolized by knocking. Importunity in prayer, symbolized by knocking. Number two, intensity in prayer, signified by by knocking. Intensity in prayer signified by knocking. Number three, iniquity in people specified as stumbling blocks while knocking. Iniquity in people is what actually makes them to have stumbling block while they are knocking. Let's come to number one. Number one, importunity in prayer symbolized by knocking. Let's come to Matthew chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 7. Now you know this is just for the sons of God, the daughters of God, the children of God. Those who are members in the family of God. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. I'm reading the last part because we're talking about knocking today. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. And then in verse 8, it talks about, To him that knocketh, it shall be opened. I told you already that that word knock, you find in verse 7, you find in verse 8, is in the present imperative. And it just means continual action, continual action. Knocking and knocking and knocking. Let me show you how that is in Acts of the Apostles chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, reading from verse 13. This is the story of uh, Peter. He had been in prison. And the people of God had been knocking at the gates of heaven. Oh Lord, release Peter. Release our leader. And don't allow Herod to touch him or to kill him. We need him. We need his ministry. They were knocking and knocking and knocking. And God opened and gave an answer. And as he gave an answer, Peter came out of the prison. And now he himself, Peter, wanted to enter into that place they were praying. What will he do? He was knocking. How did he knock? Look at it now from verse 13. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to Kaki, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. What did they say that? They said, What are you talking about? We're still praying. It's in the prison. They didn't know God had answered their prayer. Just like you are here tonight, you will not know God has answered, but He has answered. And then you will say, when I tell you, look at the miracle, look at the answer. You say, but Pastor, I'm still praying. Even before you finish praying, the door is open. And so it says over here, Peter stood before the gate, and they said unto her, Thou art mad. And but she constantly affirmed that it was so. Then said be, it was his angel. Mind you, by this time, Peter was still at the door and was still knocking. I want to enter. I want to, he was still knocking. That's the opportunity. 
Keep on knocking, keep on knocking until the door opens. In verse 16, but Peter continued knocking. Importunity. Peter continued knocking. That means don't give up so easily. And don't give in to discouragement. While you are knocking, keep on just asking the Lord. From these uh, passages we have read together, it's very obvious that the Lord was teaching us and calling us to importunity in prayer. We often give up too soon because uh, just before the door to heaven's storehouse is open. Our lack of supply is often the result of our lack of importunate supplication. If you of us are even ignorant of what is in the storehouse for us, Others knock at the door of the storehouse so feebly that you can barely hear their knocking. So very few ever knock continually with a firm hand of the prayer of faith. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11 from verse 5. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend? And shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. Again, the Lord is talking about prayer. And the Lord is saying that prayer is based on relationship. Which of you shall have a friend? I'm sure you know that somebody cannot go and knock at the door of an enemy at midnight. I have a need. I have some pressure upon me. And I have this biting need in my life. And then he goes to knock at the door of an enemy. No, you cannot do that. There has to be a relationship. And if you're going to really be, if you're going to be a person that prays and prays through, you'll be a friend of God like Abraham. Abraham was a friend of God. Because he had believed in the Lord, it was counted unto him for righteousness, you know. Darkness cannot be friend, light. God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. You know that hatred cannot be friend, love. You know God is love. In him there is no hatred at all. And you know that holiness cannot be friend, sin. And you know that God is holy. Holy, holy, holy. The Lord of hosts. And because of that, you need to come out of that darkness, come out of that hatred, and come out of that sin. And then you'll be a friend of God. Here is a friend that is knocking at the door. We need to understand that. Otherwise, we'll just be praying and praying, and there'll be no answer. There must be an established relationship as we pray for six. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me. And I have nothing to set before him. In the seven, and he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. But say it very important, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his watch. Tell me out loud, opportunity, because of his opportunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. That's what the Lord is teaching us. Because of his opportunity, asking and asking and asking. Now, we're spoken about a friend asking a friend and knocking and knocking and knocking. And the friend inside is saying, it's too late. Why did you wait until this time? I'm in bed already. But the friend keeps on knocking. You know, when you're a friend, you know, he will not feel offended. He's my friend. He will understand when he opens the door, tell him. And then eventually he opened the door. Let's look at Genesis. Let's look at Abraham, a friend of God. Knocking, praying, asking God what God will do. And we'll see here in Genesis chapter 18. Reading from verse 23. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous or the wicked? Actually, Abraham was concerned about his nephew, Lord. He was in Sodom. And God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Sodom had become the city of destruction. It had been earmarked for destruction by fire. And Abraham had a nephew there, a relative there. And because of that, he wanted to pray. Don't you have hey, don't you have a friend, a nephew, a brother, a sister, a mother, a father, a relative in the world that is marked down for destruction? Don't you know that fire is going to consume this world? Are you not concerned? You're already a friend of God. You're already a child of God. Will you not do like Abraham and knock at the door? Knock at the door. Pray with the opportunity on behalf of your relative in the world so that they will not perish for the world. Look at verse 24. By adventure there be found, there be 50 righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and spare the place for, uh, for the fifty righteous that are therein, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous or the wicked, and that, be, that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place and for their sakes. Whenever we have our night vigils, what do we pray about? Do we pray about our relatives who are still in the city of destruction? Do we pray for the Sodomites and the lesbians who are still in the city of Sodom destruction? Are we concerned about our relatives when we go for night vigil or when we pray alone by ourselves? Are we not going to be knocking and knocking at the door, Lord, spare them, O oh Lord, prolong their time, O oh Lord, don't allow them to perish. If you find 50 people there, Abraham said, will you not spare the city? And God said, if I find 50 people there who are righteous, I will spare them. And then it says in verse, in verse 27, And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which I am but dust and ashes, but venture. There shall not five of the fifty righteous will thou destroy all the city for the lack of five. And he said, If I find forty and five, forty-five, I will not destroy it. That's the opportunity. After the Lord said, if I find 50 there, I'll not destroy. Then Abraham said, Lord, can I talk again? I have 45. And God said, that's all right. I'll not destroy them. And then it goes on in verse 29. And he spake unto him yet again. And said, for adventure, there shall be 40 found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, would, would let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak for adventure, there shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. For adventure, there shall be twenty pounds there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, Don't oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak yet, but this once, for adventure, ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. That's the opportunity. Asking, knocking, seeking, praying, pleading, interceding until the Lord gave an answer. And that's what the Lord is telling us we ought to do in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 9, we're looking at verse 18. And I fell down before the Lord as at the first 40 days and 40 nights. I did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your sins which you sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger of, of the whore and the hot displeasure therewith, or, uh, wherewith the Lord was wroth against you to destroy you. But the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. And I prayed for Aaron also the same time. 
What had happened here is that Moses went to the mountain top to go and get the Ten Commandments for the children of Israel. Before he came back, uh, Aaron had made an idol for them. The whole nation had backsliding. And God said, I'm angry with them. I'm going to destroy them. And Moses came back. He saw them dancing like idol worshippers. And round the idol, they restored. And then Moses said, Aaron, why have you done this? And Aaron said, don't be angry with you. You know these people. I couldn't stand them. If I said I will take my stand, I will not compromise, they will stone me. And so eventually Moses got to the people, ground uh, that thing in powder. And he, he disciplined them, but he prayed for them. He prayed for them. And we leaders need to learn a great lesson. To start with, you have Moses, then you have Aaron. Aaron was a leader. A leader under the leadership of Moses. And Aaron did something wrong. What he did was very bad, making the whole nation to backslide. You couldn't do something greater than that, more terrible than that. But you see, Moses, even though he rebuilt him, what did you do this Aaron? Yet he prayed for him. We who are leaders, state of overseers, over region of overseers. If a region of overseers do something wrong, of course, of course, state of overseers, you have to rebuke them. But you must pray much for them. You don't want the destruction of your subordinates, those who are working under you. And then region of overseers, we have all these local government pastors, they do something wrong. Of course, if you need to rebuke them, chastise them, even discipline, that's all right. But we don't stop there. You know, there are people, just disciplined people, and that's all right, but do you pray for them? They say they are not serious. I'm not sure how, how, how serious Aaron was. In fact, what Aaron said was like giving excuse. Moses, don't be angry with me. You know the people. That was an excuse. And Moses said, God wanted to destroy Aaron, but I prayed for Aaron. And in those of us who are, you know, we're group coordinators here, ministers of God, and our coordinators do something wrong, of course, you have the right. It's your right and responsibility. Challenge them, rebuke them, reprove them, and discipline them if, if you need to. Of course, you'll check up with me. But all the same, after the discipline, we need to pray for them. And we will pray with importunity. You know, sometimes some, somebody is under discipline. One month has gone, two months, three months, six months. And then we ask, brother, that person you put on discipline, how is he? Oh, he's not serious. Well, maybe he's not serious, but maybe we who are leaders are not praying for them like Moses prayed for Aaron. And also the whole of the children of Israel. God said, Moses, leave me alone. Let my anger wax hot against them. And Moses for 40 days and 40 nights, interceding, pleading, knocking at the door of mercy. That's what we need to do as leaders. Don't just discipline, intercede, pray, get on your face. And then you are wrestling in prayer, oh God, forgive him. Oh God, make use of him again. That's what we need to do. We'll do that in Jesus' name. Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9, we're reading from verse 2. Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, praying, praying, knocking with importunity. Verses 2 and 3, in the first year of, the, of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books, the number of the years where, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And he continued to pray. Look at verse 10. As we look at verse 10, it says in verse 10, Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, and which is set before us by his servants. 
and is the prophet. You know something about knocking and knocking? When Daniel was praying, I'm sure you, you've known about Daniel. If you look at Daniel chapter 6, don't open, I'll just tell you. It was like that man was an innocent man, a righteous man, a perfect man, a flawless man. No fault in his life. But when he was praying for the children of Israel, he didn't go to God and say, God, here am I. They are bad, I'm good. They are unrighteous, I am righteous. And they are terrible, but I am good. No, he identified what the people. This is our problem. It's the whole body. If your finger has problem, you say, I can mind his business, that's his problem. If your toe has problem, it's, it's a problem for the body. And so Daniel understood that if we're going to knock and knock it with the right attitude, if your brother has a problem, if your sister has a problem, if a part of the church has a problem, if a local government has a problem, or if a section in our church has a problem, you will not say that's their problem, that's their cup of tea. Let them drink their cup of tea. No, we're all concerned and we intercede, we intercede. And then you're watching, oh Lord, you have not answered our prayer. Answer our prayer concerning this section of the church. Answer our prayer concerning this local government. Answer our prayer concerning this country, this nation. You know, sometimes we supervise, we're finding out how is the work of the Lord going on in this nation, in this nation, and then they bring the report back. And they say, oh, that nation, they're not keeping to the word of God in totality. They're not like the headquarters church. We don't laugh about that. We don't gossip about that. It becomes our problem. It's we together. That's how Daniel prayed, and he was praying with importunity. That's what we're going to do from now on. And God will answer our prayer. And anybody having a problem in our church, when we all take it like that, God will solve the problem. And those, if anybody is under discipline, you know sometimes in our districts, in our groups, uh, or in our state or region, brother so and so is under discipline. What have you done about that? Intercede. Knock at the door. And say, God, restore our brother, restore our sister. That's what we need to do. And when we do that, God will answer. Look at verse 20. Whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin, that's identifying with the people, and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God, the, for the holy mountain of my God, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh Daniel, I am now come forth to give this skill and understanding at the beginning of the supplications. The commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Actually, many days passed before the answer came. But the, but the answer eventually came, and the answer will always come. Jesus is waiting for us to come and knock at the door. Whatever our needs are, the door will be open and we shall be satisfied with what? Number one, justification. Number two, there will be salvation. Number three, there will be regeneration. God will recreate us again, recreation. Number four, there will be transformation. If we will pray with opportunity and just pray and pray and pray and will not let go until the Lord answers, there will be answer for transformation. Number five, there will be provision. Number six, there will be restoration. Number seven, there will be imputation. That is, the, the, the riches and the resources of the Lord, the righteousness of the Lord will be imputed and imparted unto us. Number eight, there will be sanctification, purification. Number, number nine, there will be impartation of the power of the Lord into our lives. Number 
Number 10, there will be protection. Number 11, there will be preservation. And then we'll get to heaven. I said we'll get to heaven. That's glory. There will be glorification. We are not knocking only to only to stop after receiving an initial supply of grace. We keep on knocking. We keep on praying. We keep on interceding until we receive abundant grace, sufficient grace, grace for every need. That means like Abraham, we keep on knocking until our relatives are saved. Like Daniel, we keep on knocking until our nation is delivered from Babylonian corruption and captivity. That means, like Moses, we keep on knocking until uh, Aaron, the leaders who have compromised, until God restores them back into their ministry and office again. And then the consequence of the compromise of Aaron, God wipes everything away. That means we keep on knocking at the early church until Peter, the apostle, is totally delivered and the minister is released and his ministry is released out of the prison. We come to point number two now, intensity. The intensity in prayer signified by knocking. We come back to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, we read reading from verse 7 from verse 8. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. In verse 8, for every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. To him that knocketh, it keeps on knocking and knocking until the door is opened. Again, we're talking about that and we're saying that's intensity, intensity, intensity in prayer. Luke chapter 13, verse 25. Luke 13, verse 25. When once the master of the house is risen up and has shut the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock, to knock, to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and ye shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. The knocking here is incessant knocking, intensive knocking, very serious knocking that the person inside will hear that somebody is knocking. The fervency of our prayer, the force of our faith, often show how important our request is to us. Coming back to this illustration of knocking, the desperate man who is knocking at the door to meet a pressing need will knock differently from a casual visitor with no definite purpose. You know, if you went to somebody's house, no purpose, you just say, what am I doing? That there's, I have nothing doing at home. Where will I go now? No place. Okay, let me go to so-and-so's house. Then you get in front of the house. Remember, no purpose, no goal, no desire. Nothing you are looking for. Just for one away time. And then you knock at the door. If there is no answer, oh, I thought so. I knew he would not be around. Even look at the time that he shouldn't be at home now. Then you go back. Because you are a casual visitor. But if you have a desperate need, something body, something so very serious that you just feel, I must get him. I must see him. I must know whether he's there or not. The way you knock will be very different. That's what the Lord is saying. Knock and see if you have a real need, a great need, a high need that you'll not give up. Those who knock casually in prayer, they pray casually. There's no intensity. How do you know? Number one, they have wandering thoughts in prayer. After all, there's no specific need. They are casual. Number two, they are formal and they repeat the same phrase in prayer every time they pray. They are very casual. They don't know what they are asking. Number three, they do not have any specific need in prayer. I just want to go and pray. And there's no specific need. Such people will not knock with intensity. Number four, they are visually sleep off when praying. 
after all, uh, there wasn't any burden, there wasn't any sorrow in their heart, there wasn't any pressure on them. Therefore, they will sleep up. Number five, they lack freshness of thought and they have no grip on any promise of God. They have no grip on any promise of God because actually their knocking is so feeble. The knocking is so, is so unimportant that nobody will even think of hoping. Number six, they do not remember what they are prayed for and they are unconscious of their spiritual stage. Number seven, they are like the Laodicean people who are lukewarm in the closet, too lazy to seek urgent remedy for their spiritual problem, spiritual malady. What do we need? If God is going to answer our prayer, we need to know with intensity. It's that intensity in prayer that actually makes us to be able to get the answer. Now, when I talk about intensity, if you have uh, something to write, maybe at uh, the margin of your outline there, write intensity, but write it vertically. That means I N T E N S I T Y. It's right there on point number two, intensity. How do you understand somebody that has intensity in prayer? What do you see? Number one, integrity, like that of Abimelech. Let's look at Genesis chapter 20. Intensity begins, that means intensity in prayer, begins with integrity. And let's look at Genesis chapter 20. And we're looking at it from verse, uh, reading from verse 5. Said he not unto me, she is my sister, and she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. What had happened is that this Abimelech took the wife of Abraham. Because Abraham said, she's my sister. And Sarah said, he is my brother. And so in the innocency of his heart, he took Sarah. And then God came to him and said, you are a dead man. And meanwhile, the whole of the family became barren. And God said, all right, to solve the problem, go to Abraham. He'll pray for you. If you really have integrity, restore the man, his wife. Look at verse 7. Now therefore restore the man, his wife. For he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. A, pro a person like that will be have intensity in prayer, will rush into prayer very quickly. I'm dead, I'm gone. He's going to die prematurely. And meanwhile, everybody in the family became sterile. And they were barren. And so we're told in verse 14, Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him, Sarah, his wife. Intensity in prayer is not just crying, just weeping, rolling on the ground, lying on the floor walking on pebbles. That's not intensity. If you have Sarah, another person's wife, you don't have integrity, and you are rolling on the ground, and you are crying. That's no intensity. Intensity begins with integrity. And then now, and that means nothing else. This is all I need. I don't need any other thing. I need this, and nothing else will satisfy. And look at 1 Samuel chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 1. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, you know the story of Anna. And she had intensity in prayer. How do you know that she had intensity in prayer? Every other thing that the husband gave her was not satisfied. And her language was nothing else. This one thing I need. That will give you intensity. When you spot out just one thing, just one thing, it may be you'll be coming to church for a long time, you are not born again. And then you become deadly serious. There's one thing I must have. It may be that you see that your life is spoiled with anger and with violence, and you've lost your job because of that anger. 
Your wife is about packing up because of that anger. Your children are not willing to stay at home because of that anger. And then the house fellowship is, uh, if you're in house fellowship, the house fellowship is scattering because of that anger. Everything is going upside down because of that anger. And you wake up and say, there's one thing I must have. The peace of mind, the gentleness, I don't need any other thing. You become so serious of this that you have intensity. For Samuel chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 4. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all, uh, and to all her sons and her daughters' portions. But unto Anna he gave a double a worthy portion, for he loved Anna, but the Lord has shut up her womb. The husband gave her a worthy portion, but that will not satisfy her. Then in verse 9, so Anna rose up after they had eaten and in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept so. And she bowed a bow. You know the story. She, want, she wanted nothing else. Nothing else. Just a son. That's intensity. When you have this kind of intensity, God will answer the prayer. Because you knock and knock and knock. Tea travail of the soul the travail of the soul inside your heart you know Anna had bitterness in her soul not bitterness to hate anybody that's just talking about the sorrow about the concern about the agony the travail of the soul Isaiah chapter 53 and I'm reading verse 11 he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. He shall see the travail of his soul. That's what you call intensity in prayer. Number one, there's integrity. Integrity. Anything you know belonging to other people, you return it to them. A wife, a man, husband, a daughter, you didn't pay any dowry, and then your conscience is reminding you, even to keep this lady just like that, and then you are praying, give me this, give me that. If you're going to have intensity, right, you must have integrity. And then nothing else. This one thing I need. And then the travail of the soul. And then E, earnestness in supplication. Earnestness in supplication. We're looking at Luke chapter 22. That's intensity. Oh, you have earnestness. You're so earnest about it. You're not sleeping. You're not dozing. You're not yawning. You're so intense about the prayer you're offering to God. In Luke chapter 22, verse 44, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. Earnestness in prayer. Earnestness in supplication. He prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as, as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And then, and that is nobody else. That is, you know, sometimes when you're looking for something, if you think uh, uncle can solve this problem, you'll not pray much. If you pray at all, you just pray a snapshot prayer. You will not have intensity in prayer. Once you feel, okay, I think I can have an alternative to this and I'm looking for so and so can do it, so and so can help, so and so can help, you'll not have intensity in prayer. But when you realize this thing I'm asking for, the doctor said there is no way. And then people said, there is no way. History and experience, they are saying, nobody ever got healed in this. Even the people that you know could have helped, they said, please, there's, there's nothing we can do about this case. If this problem is solved, only God. When there is nobody else, they become, you intensify your prayer. That's what gives us intensity in prayer. When there is nobody else. Now let's look at Psalm 107. Psalm 107. I'm reading from verse 12. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. When there was none to help, and they knew this problem, nobody else, nobody else except God. 
no rich man except God. No uncle, no cousin except God. No man on earth anywhere can help me in this. If I ever get out of this, it has to be God and God alone. That's what gives you intensity in prayer. Verse 13. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and it saved them out of their distress. It brought them out of, the, of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands in sunder. Then as sense of urgency. The situation that demands urgent attention. That's what gives you intensity. When you have a problem and you say, this situation, if I wait till tomorrow, I'm gone. If I wait until next week, the thing will not just be bad, it will get worse and I don't know where I will be. It is that sense of urgency that gives you intensity in prayer. And look at Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. I'm reading from verse 6 and verse 7. And the messengers return to Jacob saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he came to meet thee, and four hundred men with thee. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And, you know, they gave him the information, Esau is coming. He has four hundred valiant warriors with him. He is determined that by the morning light, Tomorrow morning, the 400 soldiers, warriors, mighty, valiant men, they will get to you. You are finished. And then Jacob says, the urgency, the urgency of the matter. You know, that's why we, we have intensity in prayer. If you feel, well, I can still, I can solve that problem next week. No big deal. That thing can even wait for next month. No big deal. You're not going to have intensity in prayer. You'll be praying and yawning. You'll be praying opening your eyes, looking here and there. It's the sense of urgency that gives you the intensity in prayer. And let's look at that now in verse 24. Verse 24. And Jacob was let alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his tie, and the hollow of Jacob's tie was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go for the day breakers. And he said, I will not let you go except thou bless me. How can I let you go? Esau is coming nearer and nearer. Those 400 men uh, that are with Esau, they are breathing threatening and death and murder. And they are closer now than they were last night. They say, let you go. How can I let you go? I will not let you go except you bless me. It was a sense of urgency of the matter that made him to have that intensity in prayer. I, intimacy of the Father. Intimacy of the Father. And you know, if you are going to be uh, importunate like that, and also have that kind of intensity like that, you are very sure that, you know, if you stay there, you are going to get an answer. Because you are intimate with the Father. Intimacy with the Father. In Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12, verses 7 and 8. Numbers 12, 7 and 8. My servant Moses is not so. Who is faithful in all mine house? With him will I speak mouth to mouth. Even apparently, and not in that speeches, and, we, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore, then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Uh, I want you to picture this now. Moses had been on the mountain top for 40 days. And I've been in the very presence of the Lord for 40 days, intimacy, very close to the Lord. At the end of the 40 days and 40 nights, I've been with the Lord, very intimate with Him. He was coming down, uh, down the mountain. And then God said, go back to your people. They are backsliding. And now I'm rejecting them. And this man had just been with the Lord for 40 days, looking at uh, the glory of the Lord for those 40 days. 
no, no wonder. Because of that intimacy, he had the confidence, he had the faith, he had the trust. That's why he was in, he intensified his prayer. Oh Lord, don't destroy them. Intimacy uh, will help you to actually have that intensity in prayer. T, trusting only absolutely in God. Trusting only, only absolutely in God. God, I have no other solution. Lord, I don't have any other alternative. Lord, I don't have any other supply. Lord, I don't have any other helper. You trust only in Him, in and then, and seriously and actively and absolutely in Him. And that's how you get your prayers answered. You see why people pray and their prayers are not answered? Because they just pray casually. And they don't understand the intensity that goes on along with the knocking and knocking. Psalm 40, I'm reading verse 4. Psalm 40, verse 4. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. He says, a backslider will not solve my problem for me. A hypocrite will not solve my problem for me. The rich people of the world who rob Peter to pay Paul will not, uh, will not uh, answer, they will not uh, meet my need. And the people will say, where is the Lord your God? You've been going to church and going to church. Now you have a need, you are coming to us. They will not answer my, uh, they will not uh, supply my need. Only God, the right trust. A person like that, that trusts in God and God alone. And he says, oh Lord, if you don't help me, there's no other help in any other place. I trust in you absolutely. Those are the people who have intensity in prayer. And then why? Yielding completely to God. Yielding completely to God. You say, God, I'm in your hand. I'm in your hand. If you don't do this, I'm dead. If you don't do this, I'm gone. If you don't do this, there's no solution here. This is a terrible situation. Second Samuel chapter 24. In Second Samuel chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 14. Yielding completely to God. Second Samuel 24 verse 14. And David said unto God, I am in a great stretch. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord. For he for his mercies are great. Let me not fall into the hand of man. Something had happened. David did something wrong. He sent Joab to go and count the children of Israel. Now there's nothing wrong in counting. There's even a book in the Bible, the book of Numbers. Nothing wrong in counting. Nothing wrong in counting. When Jesus fed the 5,000 and the women and the children, they counted them. The 4,000, they counted them. And on the day of Pentecost, when they were praying, they counted those people. 120 were praying. And when those people were born again, 3,000 received the Lord gladly and were baptized. And then later, another 5,000 joined them. Nothing wrong in counting. But David had a wrong purpose. A wrong motive. And Joab said, My Lord the King, why will you do this? They go and do it. I'm the king. When he did it, he got into trouble. And then God said, Prophet God, go and talk to David. Problem has come. Should I leave him in the hands of his enemies to deal with him? Should I leave him in the hands of strangers, foreigners to deal with him? Or do I handle him myself? Intensity in prayer. Intensity in now. He wanted to solve the problem. And he said, this one, I will yield completely to God. If I'm going to die, I will die at the feet of the Lord. I have no other place to go. The wrath of God is against me. The anger of God is against me. And I'm not going to run away from him. Intensity in prayer made him to just say, God, here am I. You chose me. You anointed me. You put me in place. Now I've done this foolish thing. I've blown it. And what are you going to do to me, Lord? I'm in your hand. Don't, don't push me into the hands of men. You see, that's intensity in prayer. Look at that verse again. In verse 14, David said unto God, I am in a great strait. What a great problem I have. Let us fall now into the hands of the Lord. For his mercies are great. Let me not fall into the hands of man. That's what the Lord is telling us about prayer. Knock, 
and it shall be open unto you. For everyone that he that knocks, uh, to everyone that knocks, the door will be open. And from tonight, now you understand, you are going to pray. Importunity in prayer. And then intensity in prayer. And God is about to answer your prayer. Intensity is demonstrated by the righteous whose fervent prayer availeth much. Watch Jacob at Peniel. Observe Elijah on Mount Carmel. Visit with Abraham as he intercedes for Sodom. Follow Moses to the mount where he pleased for backsliding Israel on the verge of destruction. Kneel beside Daniel as he prays for the for Israel's 70 year captivity to end, feel the great heaviness of con and continual sorrow in Paul's heart as he cries in prayer for the salvation of his kinsmen according to the flesh. And you will catch a glimpse of what it means to knock with importunity and intensity. Welcome to point number three now iniquity in people specified as stumbling block while knocking. Iniquity in people specified as stumbling block while knocking. You see why some people knock and they are not answered? Because there's iniquity, unconfessed sin, unrepented sin, a sin they still cherish, a sin they're still holding on to. That's why many of them are not answered. In Luke chapter 13, Luke chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 25, Luke 13, 25, when once the master of the house is risen up and has shut the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not, whence ye are, depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. You need to open the door to them because of iniquity. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. It's sin that hinders prayer when you are knocking and knocking, you even fast. You do everything you think you know how to do. Say, God, you are the only one I depend upon. But God does not open the door because of unconfessed sin. In Psalm 66, verse 18. 66, verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I regard iniquity, if I love iniquity, if I cherish iniquity, if I hide iniquity, if I protect iniquity in my heart, if I embrace iniquity in my heart, secret sin, you're not willing to part ways, and you're covering it up, excusing it, and you are in love with that iniquity. How can I give up this? Oh God, just answer me. Oh God, just answer my prayer. Oh God, just walk a miracle for me. Oh God, just deliver me. How about this iniquity? Oh Lord, don't talk about that. I love that iniquity so much. I cannot give it up. Oh, your knocking will be in vain. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. In Isaiah chapter 59, Isaiah 59, I'm reading verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot say, neither is ear heavy, that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. You see, God hates iniquity. And it doesn't matter where God finds that iniquity. He may find it in somebody who is very high, even in the church. Or he finds it among people that are very popular in the fold, in the church. Or he finds it among people that are very gifted and talented among the people of God. Anywhere he finds iniquity. If he finds it among the warriors, 
among the soldiers of Christ, like Achan, like the team, the soldiers, the army of Joshua. Anywhere he finds that iniquity, God is no respecter of persons. If you regard iniquity in your heart, the Lord will not answer your prayer. And that's what it says over there. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened. That he cannot say, neither is he a heavy, no, he can hear, he's not deaf. All the knocking and the knocking and the knocking. Yes, he can hear, that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. Jeremiah chapter 5. In Jeremiah chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 25, Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah chapter 5, very important verse of scripture, verse 25. But your iniquities, have you noticed all these references we're looking at? Luke chapter 13, iniquity, you workers of iniquity. In Psalm 66, again, it's that word, iniquity, heavy, heavy word. That means a sin, not light, superficial sin, very heavy, heavy weight sin, hanging on your neck and in your heart. And then it goes to Isaiah 59, still talking about iniquity. And now it comes to Jeremiah chapter 5, and it's still using that same loaded word, heavy word, iniquity. It says in that verse 25, your iniquities have turned away these things and your sins are withholding good things from you. And that's what the Lord is telling us, get rid of that iniquity. Because it will act as a stumbling block while you keep on knocking. And God says, you don't listen to me, I will not listen to you. I pleaded with you, I sent my preachers, my sermons to preach to you, and then I even gave you promises, I did everything I could do, but you are still holding on to your iniquity. You didn't listen to me, then I will not listen to you. What does the Lord then want us to do? He wants us to confess and forsake, abandon all those iniquities, and then if we do that, the Lord will answer our prayer. Give me a good day. Amen. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 14. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. Here it says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. And you know, so it takes humility for you to accept, for you to confess. Go to get rid of that iniquity. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. Isaiah chapter 1. In Isaiah chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 16. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16. Confess, forsake, abandon, reject, run away from that iniquity. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 16, wash you, make you clean, put the evil of your doings away from before mine eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widows. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, willing to confess, willing to forsake, willing to be cleansed, willing to be free from sin, willing to live a righteous life, a holy life, a life that is pleasing unto the Lord, willing to abandon the iniquity. You do it voluntarily. I know iniquity will destroy me. And if I give it up, small ones, big ones, heavy ones, light ones, I give them up. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, 
If you love your sin more than you love God, and you cannot give it up, say, God, if you want, if whatever you want to do, my sin is my sin. The girlfriend is girlfriend. Boyfriend is boyfriend. Sin partner is sin partner. The money I stole is mine already. I cannot give it to I love my money more than I love God. If you can willing, you repair and refuse. It says, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. You'll just be knocking in vain, but you will not knock in vain. We're looking at James chapter 5, James chapter 5. And I'm reading there from verse 16. James chapter 5, verse 16, confess your faults one to another. Don't play hide and seek again. That he is, uh, you know, here we are in the church, we are family, we are family. You have done something wrong, you see your overseer, you see your coordinator, you see your group coordinators. Don't play this side and seek again. Let's, let, let's, let's come to the Lord this year. And then with a pure heart and pure intention, a holy, righteous life, we will have the confidence and then we we'll knock at the door and the Lord will answer. Don't wait until you know they are writing petition they are writing letters they are writing to our state overseers writing to our region overseers uh, this our worker here is doing this or that and then they are, they are reporting us to our coordinator group coordinators why do you wait until that time go to the coordinator yourself he's your father in the lord go to the group coordinator the state overseer or whoever themselves don't, don't wait just, just confess and say you know uh, daddy or whatever you want to call them I'm sorry I did something foolish I did something I shouldn't have done I feel ashamed of myself in fact for me to come and tell you how could I open my mouth and tell you this what is it, what have you done and then you begin to cry not pretending and then the leader the coordinator is crying with you what is it my brother, what is it my sister this is what I did and both of you go your knees there you confess and forsake, and I'm telling you, the heavens will open doors for you. Miracles will come upon your life. Once we stop all the hide and seek a kind of business, confess your falls one to another, and pray one for another that she may be healed. Sickness will not kill you. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. When Satan has nothing to accuse you of anymore, you come to the throne of grace, you knock like this, this very night, the door will be opened unto you. Hebrews chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then, we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. For we are not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. But was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The Lord will help you. This problem will not overpower you. And you will not drown in the sea of sorrow in Jesus' name. In Job chapter 22. Job chapter 22. Verse 21. Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. I say good shall come unto thee. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth. Lay up his word in thine heart. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away. Thou shalt put away. Thou shalt put away. Iniquity far from thy tabernacles. Then... You know, it's when you put that iniquity away, then you can come and knock, then you can come and pray. Verse 27, Thou shalt make thy prayer unto him, and he shall hear thee. And thou shalt pay thy vows, 
Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. And the light shall shine upon thy ways. This year is going to be a wonderful year. Get rid of iniquity, then you can come and knock. Tonight, the doors will be open. Let's rise up. We're going to knock. Remember, opportunity in prayer. Remember, intensity in praying. And you have that, you already have that intensity. As you tell the Lord, Holy oh Lord, I want my prayers to be answered. If you are not saved, you are asking the Lord, Lord, I need your salvation. If you are not sanctified, Lord, I need sanctification. If there's backsliding, you are saying, Lord, I need restoration. If you have been hiding your iniquity, your sin, you say, Lord, I bring everything out. No more hide and seek anymore. You have been cold and dry. You are coming to the Lord, oh Lord, refresh me spiritually. This lukewarmness, coldness, take everything away. If you have been selfish and self-centered, if you have been proud and haughty, pompous, incorrigible, you want to come to the Lord saying, Oh Lord, this year to be a different year, a new year. Lord, just I want humility of heart, lowliness, meekness before you. You know, it is when that is done, you can knock and then the Lord will open the door for you. If you have any bad habits? Anger that is capturing your family, anger that is taking away good things away from you, that even the promotion you ought to have gotten in the place of work, nobody even wants to look at you two times because of your life, because of your habit. You want to come to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry about this. If iniquity be in thine hand, take it away. There must be integrity for you to have real intensity in prayer. You have a Sarah you are taking from Abraham, restore her. You have any substance you are taking from other people unlawfully, restore that substance. Anything you are taking from others, you are stolen from your place of work. You're stolen from the family. You're taken from the rightful owners. You want to tell those people, have integrity, have integrity. Is there something very important to you? Sanctification, this one thing I need, nothing else. Then you have intensity in prayer, holiness, righteousness, purity of heart. A ticket to heaven. Then you have intensity. But you say, nothing else, Lord, give me this. That's why God answered the prayer of Solomon. He said, Lord, nothing else, give me wisdom, give me understanding. Nothing else. Travail of the soul. Your soul, the soul is turned up. There's agony in the heart. Because of your spiritual level and because of your spiritual poverty, because of your spiritual superficiality, the cycle in your soul, travail of soul. As soon as thou travailed, the both false children, your spiritual barrenness is concerned to you, the soul with which to greet the Lord. No convert. Your travail. The church under your leadership is not growing. Your travail. Your house fellowship is not growing. Your travail. Members of your family are not saved. Your travail. The travail of soul. That's what brings the intensity. The earnestness, you are earnest about it. The Lord Jesus Christ, being in agony, he prayed more 
honestly, fervently. It's not honestness that the Lord is looking at. You're knocking, you're knocking, you're knocking. Lord, I need this spiritual thing. Lord, I need this spiritual transformation. Lord, I need this spiritual change in my life. That intensity of the earnestness. And then you say, Lord, nobody else will do this for me. Nobody else can save my soul. Nobody else can sanctify me. Nobody else can baptize me the Holy Ghost. Nobody else can open my blind spiritual eyes. Nobody else can make me fervent and prayerful. Nobody else can make me overcome temptation. Nobody else, nobody else can do this great spiritual thing for me. Lord, I need you more than I need any other person on earth. It is that realization of nobody else that makes you to have intensity in prayer. You have a sense of urgency. Lord, this must be done. Urgency. A situation that demands urgent attention. Your family. Your life. You're working for the Lord. Your spiritual situation. You say, Lord, this situation demands urgent attention. Anything like that in your life? Is it about your child? Is it about your husband? Is it about your wife? Is it about your place of work? Is it about your spiritual condition? Is it about that bad habit that has been there for a long time, needs to be broken, got rid of? You have a sense of urgency. Are you struggling with hatred in your heart, malice in your heart, bearing grudge in your heart? Are you struggling with temptations, trials you cannot overcome? A sense of urgency. We don't know when the Lord will come. Lord, get rid of this out of my life. Intimacy with the Lord. Getting nearer, closer to the Lord. So that the Lord will hear you knocking. You trust Him. You trust Him. Only Him. Absolutely Him. Concerning this particular need of your life. And you lay everything you have on the altar, yielding completely to the Lord. Oh Lord, I'm in your hand. Oh Lord, I'm in your hand. Oh Lord, I'm in your hand. I'm not depending upon any other person on earth. You are the one to solve this problem for me. It's that is intensity that makes prayer to be answered knock and it shall be open unto you to him that knocketh it shall be opened to him that knocketh it shall be opened have you discovered iniquity there unrighteousness there, hypocrisy there in your heart. If iniquity be in thy hand, put it far away from you. An Achan in the family can hinder the prayer of the family. Husbands stealing money from the place of work, bringing back home while spending the money, that can hinder prayer in the family. Do a lot of havoc 
in the family. That in Nikochi put it far away. Immorality seen, put it far away. Fornication, put it far away. Stealing, search, put it far away. Love of money, put it far away. In the prayer. That's why heaven's doors are locked to many people. Sin partners, sorrow those things far away. All the iniquity in your hands. Make this year a year of praying through, a year of receiving your miracle. A year of getting heaven's doors opened. Let this year be a year of trusting the Lord only, trusting the Lord absolutely. Let this year be a year of obedience to the word of the Lord. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, he shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Make it a year of intimacy with the Lord. Make it a year of fellowship and friendship with the Lord. And then you can come as a child of God, as a son in the family, a daughter in the family. Then you can come as a friend of God like Abraham. And knock and knock and knock with opportunity. And then the Lord will answer your prayer. He will answer. If you put iniquity far away from your tabernacle, if my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that she may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you at this time. We do bless your name for opening up the scriptures for us. Thank you, Lord, because you have shown us beyond any shadow of doubt that this promise of knocking and having the doors open, they are for the children of God. And for those who are children of God, we praise your name. We know you are going to answer their prayers in Jesus' name. For those who are to be children of God, but up till this time, they have been children of wrath, children of the wicked one, children of perdition, and children of disobedience, and children of the devil. Oh Lord, they had to turn, they had to change, they had to seek you, they had to repent and come to you. Give to every one of them in Jesus' name. They had to totally confess and forsake their sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross of Calvary to give them forgiveness and salvation. Oh Lord, I pray you give to everyone in Jesus' name. 
And then there's a work of regeneration, a work of transformation, a work of recreation that you do so that everyone becomes a new creature in the kingdom in Jesus' name. And now, as children of God, washed in the blood of the Lamb, cleansed in the blood of the Lamb, clean, righteous, and holy, sons of God, daughters of God, with no hidden sin, with no covered sin, with no sin that they cherish in their heart, and with no sin they regard in their lives. Now we can come to you and knock at the door. I will know that from tonight you are opening the door. You are opening the windows of heaven, and you are showering your blessings upon your righteous, holy, purified people in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, in every life, blessing. Every family, blessing. All our leaders, Lord, our leaders have been praying for us. We have not been praying enough for them. Over our state overseers, national overseers, and region overseers, our group coordinators, our coordinators, our leaders who are laboring day and night upon us. Oh, Lord, we pray. Open the windows of heaven for their families in Jesus' name. Every need in their lives, material need, financial need, spiritual need, supply in Jesus' name. All our workers who are running up and down. Lord, we pray this will be the year of breakthrough. When the door has been closed on their behalf, oh Lord, I pray as we knock together, I knock and they knock and we are knocking, oh Lord, with sincerity of heart, with holiness and righteousness and with faith in our heart. All these are workers wherever they are now. I pray this year will be the year of the open door. That Lord, every blessing they have missed in the past, you give to every one of them in Jesus' name. All of us together, members of the church, children, young people, these victorious youths, and then all the brothers and the sisters everywhere, the newcomers everywhere, or anyone stepping into this church, this year is a year of breakthrough. A year of signs and wonders, a year of miracles, a year when we will know that you pour your blessings down upon everyone in Jesus' name. Lord, those who have come to the Bible study tonight, do something special for them. Break every yoke, destroy the works of the devil, silence the enemy in their lives in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray, everything they have prayed for from years past, that they said, Lord, look at what I've been asking, I've been asking, 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 knocking, and knocking, and knocking, and the sin has not been answered. This very day, answer them, O Lord. Answer them, O Lord. Wipe the tears of your people away in Jesus' name. Any of our beloved brothers, sisters, leaders, workers, uh, uh, they are rebuilt, they are under discipline, and you know, we have not been praying for them, or just say, you have not done this right, we have not done this right. Oh Lord, lift the burden away from their hearts. Oh Lord, restore them, Lord, into the favor of the Lord in Jesus' name. Lord, let blessings run after everybody. Let goodness and mercy follow after everyone that this year, everybody in this church, happiness and joy, virtue and glory, blessings and benefits, the gifts of the Spirit upon your life. This year, you will not lack. This year, you will not weep. This year, you will not cry. Joy, laughter will be in your life in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray those who have lost any member of the family, oh Lord, I pray those who lost children, lost anyone, I pray that you give them back what they have lost. Bless everyone, Lord. Let this year be that year we've been looking for. Bless this, this year, Lord. We know you have done it. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Have you noticed today is, uh, you know, the young people that clap more than the adult people? Amen. Revival has come to the youth section. Great blessings upon your life this year. Give me that clapping again now. I about you fathers and mothers, where are you? Praise the Lord. Now, the miracles have started already. This Thursday, you must give your testimony because miracles are flowing. Praise the name of the Lord. 
Thank you very much and God bless you.